So I'll try to make sure I don't speak too fast. Um, but if someone can wave at me if I start um, talking quickly, as I tend to do when I get excited. So, um, so I'm an infrastructure architect. Um, I work at Cisco. I've been doing that about 15 years. And the thing that you do as an infrastructure architect is you take components from lots of vendors and you put them together to make something that's got business value. That's essentially what we do. Um, the way we tie them together is using the network. Um, that's you know, not always, but for most of the time, that's how we build these different components together. And what I find interesting is that over my career, every single component has changed. Um, storage systems have changed, the operating systems we use have changed, the applications we run have changed. The only thing that really hasn't changed is the way we manage networks, and yet that's the essential piece. So that's long overdue, and that's really what we're addressing with ACI. Um, so a couple of, sort of introduction slides really about what we're doing. Um, when we build private clouds today, um, we can do it in many ways, but the simplest and most scalable way is to think of all the different components as stackable blocks, a bit like Lego. You can take one piece and stack it on top of the other, and it doesn't matter if you change a piece underneath that. Um, you know, and in a typical stack, we may have a number of different hardware providers, more than one um, virtualization provider. There might be different ways of providing the CPU compute stack underneath that. So what's important is that as we cross each of these boundaries, we don't have to redesign the entire stack. These things are all replaceable and stackable. And what we need then down here is effectively element managers. These need to be a discrete, well-defined API that it's easy to consume and use. And when we pick tools anywhere inside of this model, one of the most important things we have to take into consideration is how easy is it to stitch into other systems. Maybe systems from other companies, maybe systems from our competitors. It doesn't really matter. So the main factor that differentiates what's successful in this space is how well we play with other people. Um, and that's, again, something that's very much in the, format, in the front of our mind when we, des we designed ACI. This had to be an easy-to-consume piece, and we couldn't assume we were going to have an entire Cisco stack. In fact, we had to assume the opposite. We would have a very complex matrix stack. So ACI, then, is an element manager for the network. So um, a little bit more than that. What's ACI? Um, is anybody here not confused about ACI right now? Um, because I work for a company that's we're good at engineering, we're not very good at marketing. Um, I, I'm quite lucky that I don't work for a company that's good at marketing and bad at engineering, because um, there's some of those out there as well. But um, the problem with ACI, and explaining ACI, um, is we can do so many different things with it. It's a very versatile, useful tool, much like a Swiss Army knife. Um, so I've got enough PowerPoint decks on this laptop to go on for about three days. I have to try and condense this into 45 minutes. So I'm going to effectively fold in some of these tools and just focus on the core things that ACI does, the basic things that ACI does at a network level. It's not to say we can't apply it in lots of other ways as well. Right, so at a simplest level, um, ACI is a switch. It's a big switch. Um, it's based upon this familiar network topology, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of today. I saw it on a few other slides in some of the other sessions. Um, I couldn't follow them because I don't speak Polish, unfortunately, but it was a similar architecture. This is a, a leaf spine or class architecture. And what we've done is, if you think of a traditional switch, um, what you have is line cards at the front and fabric modules running at the back. And what we've done with ACI is we've really just exp exploded that so that we now have leaf switches at the front where we would have had line cards, and we have spine switches at the back where we would have had fabric modules. And rather than having a copper trace running through a chassis, we have 40 gig Ethernet connecting them up. And that alone makes a huge difference because now... I can build a switch of any size I like. I can build a switch that's got two line cards in it. I can build a switch that's got 400 line cards in it, and it's exactly the same switch. And I can spread that switch right across the data center. So I can put some of those line cards in the top of one rack, some of them in the top of another rack. I can build some of them into a specific network rack for doing 
um, northbound connectivity or network functions. The third thing then we need to do um, is provide some sort of management for that, and I'll get onto that in a moment. But for each of these ports, these all operate at line rate, they all operate as a stateless firewall. And the reason we've done this, we've, we've you know, taken this architecture, and the industry has taken this, is it's the, the most effective way to produce um, redundancy and scalability um, at an attractive cost point. So that's why you're going to see the same architecture being adopted really by everyone in the industry going forward. So essentially, on top of this then, what this is, is it's an overlay network with an integrated underlay. Um, you know, it's ideally suited to running any overlay network. Um, no surprise, because that's what it does. Um, I assume most people here have heard about overlay networks and know what they are. Um, so we focus predominantly inside the fabric on running a VXLAN overlay. And essentially, that's like running Ethernet cables on top of IP. That's what it looks like. Um, so if you think of it being Cat5 over IP, um, there's a number of problems that's going to create as you start to scale these sort of systems up, any one system. Um, if I've got five different places I'm connecting to, five different tunnels, I've got a switch that's got five ports on it, essentially. If I have a network now that's got a thousand VTEPs on it, a thousand tunnel endpoints, I've got a thousand port switch I have to try and manage, and that gets complicated. It's actually much worse than that. I've got a thousand thousand port switches if I try and build a thousand of these. So complexity doesn't go away, and running overlays in many ways makes things harder because we can build much bigger, much more complex switches than we ever did before. So the main reason we do this, though, is that we're decoupling um, location from identity. We're saying that the IP address of anything inside this fabric can be anywhere now. It's not tied to a particular rack. Um, that's not a new idea. That's called LISP. Location Identity Separation Protocol, and that's where VXLAN came from. But what it allows us to do is provide multi-tenancy at a really huge scale across one of these networks, um, while at the same time being able to do so with extreme granularity. We can be very clear about which tenants services are available on which port and make sure that they never cross over into some other tenant. So one question that um, I get asked a lot, particularly at VMware events, is people tell me I've, I've virtualized most of my estate. I don't really need to consider physical devices anymore. Um, some people even tell me they're 100% virtualized, and when we start talking about it, we find that there's a, um, a Hadoop cluster in a back room somewhere. Or, oh, and there's the Oracle solution, and we didn't virtualize that because it cost us too much in licensing. But if we think of just even a 90% virtualized environment, with 1,000 servers, as you can see the math here, we end up with three times more racks that are running physical nodes than running virtual nodes. And the numbers I've used here, I rarely see infrastructures where we are running 30 VMs per physical node. I know we can, but in practice, in reality, people run at a much lower consolidation ratio. The other thing to bear in mind is the workloads that have been left in a physical environment um, have been done in that way for a reason. They're generally either very intensive workloads or they're extremely mission critical. They might be you know, SAP um, or other environments. So we don't want to start treating those environments as second-class citizens when they're often the most important servers and services that we run. And we don't do that in ACI. Um, we have a fabric which will support running um, any sort of virtualization solution, but also any physical workload. And the way we do that is all the traffic coming into our network, no matter what it's encapsulated with to begin with, whether it's got a VLAN tag, whether it's come from a Hyper-V environment running NVGRE, or whether it's come you know, over VXLAN, we strip all those headers as it comes into our fabric, and we re-encapsulate it inside of our own overlay. One of the key benefits of doing that is that once its traffic is inside our overlay, we can't treat it any differently. We provide exactly the same type of service, irrespective of where that traffic has originated from. So now we have, if we provide 
um, layer 47 services to this traffic, it's going to be the same irrespective of where that traffic has begun with in the first place. We get the same features and we get the same treatment. Another feature of our fabric is we provide a pervasive layer 3 gateway. So every single subnet inside of our network has a default gateway on its top of the rack switch. So every single leaf is a default gateway for every single subnet. So effectively what we do is we make sure that every single IP address in an ACI fabric can talk to every other um, IP address. It's incredibly deterministic. We always know exactly how many hops we have to go to to get to anywhere in the fabric. You always either have, it's either local or you have um, two hops, spine and back down to a leaf. And that's all you'll ever need to do in ACI. So we get a very consistent amount of latency um, irrespective of what we try to do. And we can remove the need for flooding as well. Um, we know where every endpoint is inside of a fabric, so we now no longer need to flood to try and find it. We can directly send that traffic. We're still going to make it look like a flooded packet, but we actually don't send it at every single port. So the last thing I'm going to talk about really in terms of the fabric um, is some of the things we've done for scale. Um, I mentioned earlier on one of the problems about running overlay networks is that we end up with these thousands of switches, which are complex switches anyway. Um, but there's worse problems than that still. Um, it gets complicated even before you start moving addresses around. But as you start to move VMs around the system, what you find is I have to now update forwarding tables at every single point in that network. If I move, if I'm purely running software endpoints and I move a VM from one machine to another and I've got a thousand virtual tunnel endpoints, how many places in the network do I have to touch to update that forwarding table? I have to go and touch a thousand endpoints inside that network. And if it, f for any reason I drop a packet, and this runs on Ethernet, so we at some point we are going to drop packets. That's, you know, that's what we do in Ethernet. Um, I then have to try and work out how to repopulate and rebuild that entire forwarding table. So we solve that in ACI in a neat way. What we do is we keep a forwarding table locally for anything that's directly attached. And then anything else um, we assume is elsewhere in the fabric. And we only keep a complete copy inside the spines. So we have a central copy just on our spines now. So if I have traffic and it's not local, I have to send it elsewhere in the fabric. And I always do that by sending it via a spine in a leaf spine architecture. And what I run is something called a proxy tunnel router that automatically does the lookup as it goes through the spine. So now I can, can maintain a complete copy of every address inside of my network, irrespective of whether I've got 100 endpoints, 1,000 endpoints, or a million endpoints now. And I only ever have to update the leaf it was on, the new leaf it's gone to, and my spines. So now, rather than having to update thousands and thousands of endpoints, I can go up there and or update things on an order of magnitude of one. So we know this system can scale up to really large fabrics. Um, and just to prove that, this is a real customer we have running in production today. Um, they're a service provider. Um, they're currently running a little bit larger. This is a screenshot of their main APIC GUI, which this currently has about 110 leafs running on it. They're, I believe, up to about 140 leafs right now. Um, so they were an early field trial customer, so they got a bit of a leap on some of our other customers, which is why they've already got to this scale. Um, but we can build very large, very stable networks based on ACI. Right, so there's a couple of other pieces then that make up this whole picture of ACI. What I mentioned beforehand, we had our line cards and we had our fabric modules running up the back, so effectively we had our leafs, we had our spines. The piece I didn't mention was the supervisor. And what we have in this place um, is our APIC controller. This is our central policy controller for our network. However, the controller is a little bit different than probably what you've seen in some of the other presentations today about SDN. Our controller doesn't determine um, how one address talks to another address. That's, that's all taken care of inside the fabric. So the fabric is always going to make sure any endpoint can talk anywhere else. The policy controller is responsible for whether they should do or not. So this is a different question now. Should I let you know, the addresses inside a payroll talk to the addresses inside of my guest net? Probably not. But now I can just address that single problem on its own. And there's a number of benefits in taking that approach. Because it just carries policy, it doesn't carry the forwarding inside of the network, 
If for any reason there's any problem with those controllers or those networks um, become isolated from the rest of the network, the network is still capable of forwarding traffic on its own. It's completely autonomous. It will still make its own forwarding decisions. It will still converge. It will still operate um, in an optimal way. So what we need to do then is talk a little bit about this piece up top then. I've spoken a little bit about the ACI fabric, but what's this new policy model? How are we going to build networks based upon this model? First of all, I'm going to take a step back from that and talk about the fundamental problem we're trying to address with all these SDN technologies. And that's that networks have become too complicated. They become too, I mean, how many CCIE tracks do we run these days? Um, it's a difficult problem. And IP networking in particular was meant to be the solution to all this. You know, when we started out with IP, for the first few years anyway, any IP address could talk to any other IP address on the planet. So for an app developer, this was incredibly simple. All I had to do was build to an IP stack. I didn't have to write my own device drivers, which you had to do up until that point. Um, we obviously realized quite quickly that having every IP address talk to every other IP address wasn't a good idea. Like I said, payroll probably shouldn't talk to GuestNet. There's probably all sorts of other things that you don't want exposed to the big bad world. So we implemented, started to implement policy. We put firewalls in place. We put ACLs on our routers and we prevented some networks talking to others. And as this grew and as it got bigger, we had to add other systems inside there, load balancers, so we could deal with now spreading out that load to multiple different hosts. And all of this is essentially just policy. It became complicated. It's become a difficult system. If you can now go into one of these systems, and if I was to go into one of your systems and change just four addresses, but you weren't allowed to change them back, how much trouble would that cause inside one of your networks? If I could change, say, a firewall, um, the VIP of your main ERP system, um, one of your core DNS servers, and say inbound SMTP, how much of a mess would that make inside? If you couldn't change them back, it would be a really horrible problem to try out, to, to work around and try and fix. And it shouldn't be that way. So instead with ACI, we're going to try and directly map the application's requirements down to that policy piece and then let the network work it out for itself. <coughs> now there's a second problem with all this and that's to do with the languages we speak when we build these systems. We start off when we build an application talking about um, tiers of service we want it to run. We talk about its security requirements, its SLA. Um, we talk about compliance, we talk about different tenants. And that all makes sense and that's easy to draw up on, you know, on whiteboards and the application teams understand it, security understands it. The problem is we can't run a network that way. We have to translate this now into VLANs, into VRFs, quality of service. Um, and it feels a bit like a one-way hash when we do that. We hand this over to a network engineer, and the network engineer moves this over into running configs that maybe run on you know, 30, 50 different devices. But trying to move back from this network language to the application language is difficult. It's not a straightforward thing to do. And as soon as we start deploying this, this here, these two configurations will start to drift apart. And we all know this. As soon as you put anything into production, it no longer matches that nice, neat diagram you have in the filing cabinet or you know, on, on file in the system somewhere. So when we try and troubleshoot this or make changes, we're now faced with a problem in that the nice, neat picture we have drawn up doesn't actually apply to the system we've built because the system's based upon this one, and that's the one we care about. So we have to address that problem. What we need to do is try and maintain all of our network configurations at this higher level of abstraction around how things should connect, not what we have to build in a running config on 50 different devices. So this is what this model looks like. This is what we do. We define something called endpoints. And an endpoint is anything on the network with an address. It could be an IP address. It could be a MAC address. Um, in future, it could be a Docker container. We don't care. Um, and we group together endpoints that do the same thing. So these might be DNS servers. These might be the front end web servers for your exchange farm. They might be a web, you know, the web front ends or the application tier for your website. But we tie them together in something called an endpoint group. Nice and simple. Um, endpoint groups um, do the same thing. That's all you really need to remember. 
what they do is they define who can communicate. Within an endpoint group, everything can talk to everything. Any IP address that's inside my endpoint group web here can talk to any other IP address inside of my endpoint group web. Doesn't matter where they are. So this is really useful as you start to build at scale. You know, what happens normally when you have to go and deploy the 255th web server and you find you've blown out that um, slash 24 subnet? Well, now I have to go out there and provision new rules in my firewall, my load balancer, build a new VIP, all sorts of pain. Outside of an endpoint group, I can't talk to anything else. So this is a whitelist security model. That doesn't make for very good networking. We need something else in place. And that's a contract. And a contract just defines what traffic can flow between endpoint groups. It might be that, you know, if these are my exchange servers and these are you know, the outside, I might say I'm only going to allow port 25 traffic to run across this contract. So I can accept SMTP. It might be I'll say I'm going to allow DNS requests to go up into my DNS farm, but that's all that's going to be in the contract. Now, a contract can also contain information about services, send this traffic through a firewall, send it to a load balancer, and we can apply QOS as it runs across a contract as well. And what we do then is we tie these idea of endpoint groups together with contracts, and these endpoint groups can contain anything. You know, they can be a mix of physical and virtual machines. Um, they can be VMs running in VMware, Hyper-V, OpenStack. We're not precious about that. And we wrap them together to start describing now everything that an application needs from a network perspective. This becomes our abstraction layer for the network, something called an application network profile. And then this remains fairly static. You know, if you think of email as an example, email hasn't changed in 20 years. Email talks tw port 25 to another SMTP server. It talks port 53 to a DNS server. And if you do that, you can make an, an email MTA work. That was the same when I started this job 20 years ago. That was the same with mainframes, talking to Solaris boxes, talking to Silicon Graphics workstations. Same thing today with Exchange servers, talking to Linux, talking to an iron port sitting on the other side of the net somewhere. So this becomes a very nice scalable model. It doesn't specify the size or the scale um, or any of the things that we inherently change. All of this right now is just in software. This isn't, we haven't applied any of this to a piece of hardware yet. I haven't specified whether this is a network with two leaves or a hundred leaves. At some point, of course, we have to go and push that down onto the physical devices. So the APIC's determining whether two devices, not whether they can talk, but whether they should talk to each other. The APIC then becomes that single point of management for the whole fabric. <coughs> and addresses can be based anywhere we like. This means that as we start to move things around our network, <coughs> all the policy now and all the security follows them as they move around. So we don't need to be concerned that doing a vMotion to somewhere else inside of a data center is going to start causing issues with you know, VMs appearing in the wrong tenant uh, or losing, losing connection to where we go. So in essence then, that's how it starts to hang together. <coughs> But there's some differences in the way that we control systems that we think are fundamental to us being able to scale and us being able to work. And a lot of this is to do with control systems. There's two ways you can build control systems. There are things called imperative control systems where you say um, exactly how you do something, but you don't specify what that is. And there are declarative control systems where you just don't give you any information about how to get to the end state. Just say, make it like this. Um, I think of it as being like um, paper airplanes. I could tell you all to make a paper airplane that would fly to the front of the room, and you could all make different paper airplanes. Or I could tell you exactly how to fold a bit of paper, and you wouldn't know what you were making until the end. Um, you can do it in either way, but there's differences as you start to do this at scale. <coughs> Looking at SDN today, most of the overlay, the software overlay companies use very imperative control systems. They use OpenFlow, they use OVSDB. Um, while these work, they tell you how to get the job done, um, there are problems with that. So ACI is completely opposite. It uses a declarative model. We just say, this is the state we want that network to end up in. Um, it's the same model that's used by a lot of the DevOps tools inside the sysadmin world um, because it scales very well. So, you know, why is that? Um, 
Well, imperative has a number of problems. First of all, any problem that happens in the network needs to be resolved by the controllers themselves. Um, that's okay if you've got five nodes, but as that starts to scale, you start to have increasingly large overhead on those controllers, and they have difficulty in keeping up. One of the kind of deeper problems with this is it stifles innovation. Um, when I want to go and set out you know, what my instructions are, my imperative instructions, I have to pick an instruction set that every single device can understand. Every single one of those layer 47 companies we want to you know, help automate um, need to be able to deal with every single command I might push down to them. So we have to have a lowest common denominator um, feature set. And what that means is there's no more innovation in that space. Because if you go and implement a new feature, there's no way to go and call that. So it also means the controllers become a bottleneck. So we think that you know, imperative is the way we want to go. Now, in reality, no systems are entirely, sorry, declarative is where we want to go. No system is entirely declarative, though. Everything at some point has to go and build out a rule set that does something down at the silicon level and starts moving packets. But the name of the game is to do that as late as possible and as close to that device as possible. So what we want to do is actually make that final translation down on the device if we can. <coughs> so we need to carry that policy once we've designed it down to that switch. We want to do it in this declarative way. And there wasn't an open standard protocol to do that. So we worked with a number of our um, partners um, to build something called Opflex, which is going to be a protocol to um, communicate policy. That's exactly the same thing that's being built out into um, the Open Daylight Controller right now, which is interesting. The second piece is that all that policy piece I spoke about with EPGs, endpoint groups, and contracts, that's group policy as defined in Open Daylight OpenStack. So that's now being implemented into the OpenStack model um, in the Juno release. So what we can do then is you can start to build out effectively this whole ACI solution I've described entirely in open solutions. You wouldn't have to go and build anything based upon an Nexus 9K or from Cisco. But we think we provide enough differentiation inside of that to make it an easier system to run. Um, you'd need to build out a control plane, probably based upon BGP, and you'd need to find a way to go and actually manage all these devices inside the network. Um, but what we do is we offer complete choice about how you want to go and address that. Um, and then we provide a very good solution in terms of ACI. So ACI is a mix um, of software and hardware. I'm a little puzzled by there's some people's in, sort of insistence in the industry that um, one or other is better than the other. You know, that software defined must be better by definition than hardware to find or a mix of the two. And that to me just sounds like um, technology religion. I think if I want to have as many options as I can to solve a problem. So I really don't have any issues about you know, which way we address the problem, but I don't want to cut off you know, options that I possibly have. Um, we operate very well in the virtual world. Um, we can run you know, virtual environments. We can extend all this ACI functionality inside the hypervisor. And we can extend it into multiple hypervisors. And that could be multiple instances of a VMware world, or it could be some instances of you know, VMware vCenter environments, SCVMM from Microsoft, or inside of OpenStack. And we can start to now have workloads move between all those systems and treat them in the same way. So another myth out there right now is that there's a choice. There's a battle going on between NSX and ACI. And while there is to a degree, um, Software overlays still need hardware running underneath them. Um, and if you ever look through any of the design guides for any of the software overlay companies, now I've picked on VMware here because um, I was talking to them a couple of weeks ago, um, you find they ask you to build a leaf spine network, whatever, page 23 of the config guide, wherever it's going to be, they'll ask you to build exactly the same network we build today. Um, in addition to that, though, you still need to build all sorts of other networks, all sorts of other shared VLANs to connect these systems together. There's still going to be kernel ports running out of the hypervisor hosts that require direct connectivity. We can do that extremely well with ACI. We can build what is undoubtedly the best network to run overlays on today on the marketplace. And that shouldn't really be any surprise, because what do we run on top of it? We run an overlay ourselves. Um, <coughs> So in many ways, um, 
to me, I sort of see this as being, well, if you want to go and build a software overlay, if you find that you have a customer with a particular use case, or there's something compelling about those solutions, um, I'd still go and look at ACI as being the underlay for that. You still need something to go and build and run and maintain and manage your leaf spine architecture. And that's exactly what we do with the APIC. <coughs> this is a very natural fit then with OpenStack as well. Um, you know, we spend quite a bit of time working on VMware solutions because they are still um, the predominantly what we see in the marketplace. But we're seeing things change, particularly in the last 12 months. We've got many, many more people starting to do OpenStack at scale um, for very good reasons. I mean, free is a pretty hard price to beat, right? Um, <coughs> today, we do this um, based upon a, an ML2 plugin into Neutron. And what we do is we build out our Neutron networks up here inside of OpenStack. And when we build a Neutron network, that defines an endpoint group, or an endpoint group here. And when we build a Neutron router, it defines a contract in between the two of them. So we can map the two ideas quite neatly, and that integration will work, it'll work out the box, actually, from Red Hat and Canonical. Um, there'll be a little bit more work if you're using someone else's distribution. And what we'll see then, um, in the Juno release, what we're going to do is, as we start to be able to implement group policy inside of OpenStack, we'll now have this idea of um, policy-based definition of how our network should work built directly into the OpenStack GUI inside of um, Neutron and Nova. And at that point, they will directly map down to what we do inside of ACI. So. I showed this picture beforehand. If you remember, you know, if I was going to sum up ACI, we could break it down really into three things. There's the policy model on top, which is something we can either do in ACI or we could do with you know, group policy and OpenStack. Um, there are the APIC controllers that deal with kind of the care and feeding of the network, making sure it's operating correctly, building up our VTEPs, building that layer three network running ISIS underneath the covers. Um, and then we really have the fabric here which I've only spoken a little bit about, so I'm going to touch on some of those points. It's interesting to note, though, that the sum of these three parts you know, is greater than if you just sum together their individual benefits. What we start to get overall in ACI is a much more complete picture. But let's look at that underlying network fabric then. There's some things we did which are quite groundbreaking, and some of this we had to do in hardware in our own ASICs. So we run an overlay for three, three reasons. First of all, it's that same use case as LISP. Location and identity separation. I want my IP addresses to be anywhere they like. Secondly, I want to be able to carry policy across my network. So I put policy inside the overlay as well. The third thing I do inside my overlay is I start to carry performance metrics, performance information about the network on a packet by packet basis. So every packet in my network now is going to take information both around the latency it's experienced on the particular path it's run across. So what was my latency going across you know, this spine leaf? I can compare that to the next packet that maybe goes across this spine down to the same leaf. And I'm going to take into account any congestion I see. So I'm going to start recording congestion, not on my first hop, leaf to spine, but end-to-end -end congestion. I can now measure congestion on the second hop inside of a network, which is a useful thing to do if I want to start optimizing the way that I do congestion management, for instance. So as I start to look at what I can do with this information, there's some interesting things. Firstly, I can start to do um, dynamic load balancing, because I know exactly the nature of the network. I can be much more intelligent about which path I choose to send traffic over when I calculate my ECMP hash. I can start to do packet prioritization without having to do all the complexities of traditional quality of service. I don't have to identify traffic, mark it, classify it, put it in queues anymore, because what I can do is I can move it onto a different path without the risk of getting out of order packets. And the reason I can do that is because I know exactly the latency of going on this path versus going on this path down to microseconds. And I can look inside a flow and say, if the gap inside my flow is larger than the, gap, the difference in latency between going on via this path or this path, I can move my flow to a different path now. So what that enables us to do is address that um, difficult you know, problem of, is this going to be an elephant flow, a big storage flow that runs for two or three days, 
It doesn't really matter about latency or transactional data, voice traffic. Because when they start, they all look the same. They all do a three-way handshake. It's all transactional. So now I can treat every single flow as being identical until it starts to become a problem. And at that point, I can now move it elsewhere. The final thing I can do is around congestion management. Because I can do this so much more intelligently, I can now load up my networks easily to 90% without increasing jitter, without dropping packets. So whereas traditionally we think of a network being full at 60%, that's when we start to see degradation, I can now run 50% more traffic over exactly the same wires purely because of the way that I'm dealing with, I'm doing accurate tracking of these packets across the network. It's a combination of what we do in hardware and the way we run that software overlay. So the real work starts on day two. Um, you know, we spend an awful lot of time talking about delivery, a lot of time about provisioning, um, and yet 80% um, of our budget is still spent on operations inside of IT. There's a famous American bank robber called Willie Sutton, who's famous for saying, when he was asked why he robbed banks, he said, that's where all the money is. Um, and it's become a, a rule that w is used both in medicine and engineering to say, you need to address the main area, that where can I make the most difference inside of a problem? Um, so we need to focus on operations inside of IT if we're really going to improve um, you know, our efficiencies. We can now provide a health score um, across our entire fabric. But what's more, we can do it the other way around. We can go and provide a health score. We can go and give you information about the way that a particular application is running. Um, and we can do that because every single packet on our network is now carrying both policy about which endpoint group, which application is it part of, as well as that performance data. Now, when you get a problem ticket come into your help desk, it never says there is a link down off rack four um, you know, going northbound, it says the users in building seven are complaining that SAP is slow today. That's what a problem ticket looks like. So we can now start to address problem tickets the way they come in naturally to us and start then work backwards to find out what actually happened inside the network. Okay, I'm going to skip that one. Um, just in the interest of time. So we haven't run any real TCO studies yet because this hasn't been out on the market long enough. Um, the closest we've got, our most aggressive customer, is internal Cisco IT. And I spent a long time inside of Cisco IT myself. That's where I joined Cisco um, and worked across the different resources. And this was the model that they came up with. But these figures are really interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, our CIO, Rebecca Jacobi, um, didn't just make these figures up because marketing told her to. I mean, they could be. These could be completely made up figures for all you care. Um, these were these are specific things that teams inside of Cisco IT were asked to measure. And Rebecca Jacobi went to these teams and said, I want you to tell me how much you think you'll be able to reduce these by. I want it to be measurable. And if you don't meet this number at the end of the year, I'm not paying your bonus. So these came from people who work in operations day to day. They've got no interest in selling ATI. And their bonus this year is based upon them hitting those figures. So I think they're probably reasonably accurate. The one that really interests me is this one at the end, compute and storage optimization. So we ran some s optimization tools on top of our private cloud deployments, a product called Cerber, if you've ever looked at it. Um, and we found we had lots of islands of utilization we couldn't use. We had servers with more memory than they needed. We had storage systems where we didn't have enough IOPS, and others where we had more of them. And some of them were in DMZ networks, they were in the wrong place in the network. And we can't optimize any further until we've got a dynamic network. So those two teams, Compute and Storage, have said that they can run return between 10 and 20% of resources back into useful service. So for the first time, I think, ever in my career, networking is doing something that's actually going to save the compute team and the storage team real amounts of money. That's money they can hand back into the overall IT pool. I find that an interesting thing, a, a, a pretty enlivening thing to be able to say as a network architect. So. Um, you know, marketing determines that I have to have at least one picture of a switch up here because I work for Cisco. Apparently, we have some um, rules around that. Um, so ACI is the best leaf and spine fabric on the market today. Um, we're bringing the scaling and efficiencies that we've become used to in the compute space into the networking space. Horizontal scaling, that's where we need to be. You know, the world has moved on. The new operational model, this new group policy model, we think it's becoming the standard approach inside of networking. Yes, we're doing it in ACI first, but I think it's going to become prevalent across our industry.
There's still big gains to be made in hardware. We can run 50% more traffic over the same wire purely because of something we did inside of an ASIC. Um, but in order to continue to see those, we need to maintain a level of intelligence and if we're going to scale. Um, networks need to become more dynamic, but before we start programming networks, um, you know, automating these at a large scale, whether that's hardware or whether that's software, we need to simplify them first of all. Otherwise, all we're going to do is create the problems we've got today, you know, 100 times faster and at 100 times bigger scale. So we need to simplify our overall approach. And ACI is our solution to going and doing that. Right, that's all I've got to say. Um, are there some questions out? There must be some questions. Who's got the... Uh, I put lots of fodder up there of our competitors, so someone must have a question about some of them. Yeah. <laughs> so any questions? No? So thank you for your speech. Thank you very and much. And big applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.